Well, welcome back to Wellspring Women, our Bible study here in Phoenix, Arizona. And we're excited that you're here today in the room and excited for those who will see this on Facebook Live and on YouTube at some point. Um, it's close to Thanksgiving, and so we have been spending a couple of weeks talking about how the Lord calls us to be thankful in the Word. And last year, or last week, we talked about being thankful in your suffering, which is a really important topic, a uh, really important discipleship point in our faith. And I was excited to be able to share that message with you. And uh, today we're going to talk about being thankful in your story. That is in the, in the specific, unique situation that God formed you for in the womb, birthed you into, and has allowed you to walk out in your life, even in some really difficult places. The destiny that he has for you and the effect that it will have for the kingdom of God on the world. And I'm excited to talk with you about that today. If in the course of this time you hear some jets flying over, those are from Luke Air Force Base, and our women and men who are faithfully serving there, learning to fly jets and go on missions around the world. So sometimes on the video uh, you might hear that and wonder what it is, but I just wanted to thank our armed forces today for what they do for us as a country. And it is a privilege to be this close to that kind of action. And so sometimes we have the noise of the flyovers. So when we think about being thankful in our own story today, I'm drawn to Westminster Abbey because I'm drawn to all things English. My great grandfather was from Wales and my grandmother always told us that we were descended from English royalty going all the way back to King James who helped to put into place the King James Version of the Bible. So I think that's very cool as somebody who God has asked to dig into the Bible and to share with people. And so I've learned a lot about Westminster Abbey. I've never been able to go to England. I hope to be able to do that someday. But it's the most pristine, the most famous church in England. In fact, it stands right next to Parliament and it literally houses history which is why it's so huge. You may not know this about the Abbey, but it has amazing architecture, and not only is it sacred, but solemn. We see that because royal weddings happen there. Also royal funerals, the most recent, Queen Elizabeth II, who we just saw uh, go through that time of mourning as a country, and her funeral was held there, though she was buried at Windsor. Um, Coronations of kings and queens happen in this abbey. In fact, this is the actual throne that they sit on at their coronation. Queen Elizabeth did. Uh, every king and queen before her for centuries did. King Charles will um, in just a very short amount of time. And so what an incredible thing that this even is in the abbey and still stands there waiting. Flags fly there for knights and nobles and royalty, and what makes it distinct and endearing to all of us are the uncommon stories of commoners who are held in honor there. It's not just the kings and queens, it's not just the nobility, it's a lot of people. In fact, there's a wall of modern martyrs on the outside of Westminster Abbey, and on this wall of just about a dozen modern martyrs is Martin Luther King Jr. Another man that you may recognize because of his faith, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And in England, they commemorate the lives of these great people, even if they're not English. There's a hall of statues in the Westminster Abbey, full of poets and explorers and scientists, teachers, historians. Shakespeare is commemorated there. Nelson Mandela, Abraham Lincoln, and William Tyndale who was instrumental in putting the Bible into print. Westminster Abbey is full of memorials and tombs. In fact, it's the final resting place for over 3,000 people in that very building. 17 kings and queens of England are buried there. This King Edward and Queen Elizabeth I in really ornate crypts. And as you walk through the church, they are all there. Charles Dickens, Alfred Lord Tennyson, Sir Isaac Newton, all are buried there. 
And what's interesting about the list of those who are commemorated is they're not all nobles, but they are all notables. Mm -hmm. Regular people whose stories served as an example of larger than life changes in the world they lived in because they stepped up and stood in their destiny, in their time for a purpose. There are carvings and engravings there, sculptures and statues, but the most beautiful are the stained glass stories. And there are lots of them. That's usually what stained glass art does. It tells a story, it commemorates somebody's uh, journey or their personhood. And there are loads of stained glass windows at Westminster Abbey. This is the capstone, actually the most famous of the windows, uh, the rose window. And this one tells the saint stories. And this is not an unusual stained glass window feature that is in many of the European cathedrals. Jesus Christ will be in the middle of that window and around him will be the 12 disciples and the four gospel writers. And then around them will be early church saints and those who made an impact on the kingdom of God early in history. And around that will be other stories of great people who stood in the moment and had faith that was unshakable. What an illustration that is to us in our own lives, that right now we live a larger story than we're even aware of. And so today I want to talk about the stained glass stories from God's Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. And we're just going to look at a couple of portraits that maybe will be unexpected to you of who God dropped into that Hall of Faith. Because I want you to see today that your story, as the master craftsman takes the broken pieces and creates a beautiful display, will be so full of his grace and will be for his glory that you will become a part of that larger masterpiece of the Lord that communicates his love and his life to a world that is waiting and watching to see what it looks like to be found and to also be faithful. And I pray that for each of us today. So let me pray and ask the Lord to lead us. Father, we thank you uh, that there are so many pictures around us of what you want in us and through us. And so today, as we talk about being thankful in our story, I pray that you would just open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would guide us into all truth, that Christ would be exalted, that we would be challenged and encouraged in our faith, and that we would see the level of commitment that you long for us to have, that our own stories, our own stained glass stories, would become larger than life representatives of your work and your kingdom for your honor and glory in Jesus name. Amen. All right, we'll take your hand out and follow along. We're going to look at three stories. And the first thing I want you to see in the first story is that God writes your story, R I G H T. He writes it when it's wrong, when you receive his best for you. Now you may say, but what if parts of my story are broken in places? Well, that's a good question. There are some of those kind of stories in Hebrews 11. And we're going to look at several of them today. Let's start with the story of Jephthah. <laughs> Jephthah, look at Hebrews 11, 32 and 33. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah. David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. Well, we know who Gideon is, and most of us know who Barak is with Deborah and Samson and David and Samuel. How many of you know the story of Jephthah from the Old Testament? Well, he's dropped right in there. And our first question is, who is this guy? And how come he made that list of people who are commemorated for their faith? So as we think about his story, I want you to understand that not only is he mentioned in the Hall of Faith of Hebrews 11, which is really the Westminster Abbey of the scriptures, but he gets two and a half chapters of airtime in the book of Judges. Only Gideon and Samson get more scripture press than that. And what's interesting 
interesting is that the two judges before him, who you wouldn't even be able to identify by name, only get two and a half verses a piece, hmm. even though each of them ruled 22 and 23 years respectively and were great judges. So what is it about this guy's life and what would the Lord want us to know about it? Why did his story get hallmarked by the Lord? Well, Jephthah was the ninth judge of Israel. You can read about his story in Judges 11 through 12. But let me just give you the short version of it. He was driven out of his home by his brothers because he was an illegitimate son. His mother was a harlot, and so he was considered worthless by his father's sons, his brothers. So he left his native land of Gilead, and he went as far as he could east to the land of Tob, Scripture tells us. And it was there that he joined a gang of raiders. He literally became a pirate in this place. And he learned the skills of war. He learned how to battle. He learned to wield a sword. And one of the things I would say to you today is some of your skills to war have come from your most broken places and God will use that spiritually in your life well when the Ammonites attacked Israel as a nation the nation sought after Jephthah and they came and got him and asked them, him if he would come back and save them he was such a strong deliverer at that point that nobody could stand against the Ammonites and so Jephthah said to the elders of Israel okay I'll come back I'll come back to my land, but when I come back, if I deliver you, I want to be your judge. I want to be your ruler. And he did. He worked out that story in his own life. And so I want you to see a couple of things about Jephthah's life that you and I can bank on today as we walk in our own stories. The first is, though rejected by his family as an outcast, he opened his heart in creating a legacy of strong faith. What's interesting about that is he actually lived up to his name. His name means he will open. And Jephthah opened his heart, and then he opened his hands, and then he opened his land to blessing. From outlier to in the line of blessing because he came back and he dealt with the brokenness and the rejection that he had experienced. And as a result, there was restoration and inheritance, and the entire nation was saved in those days because of this outlier, this outlaw who had been a pirate and came back to be one of the greatest judges of that time. The second thing I want you to see about his life is he traded what he thought was good for God's best for him. So the land he went to, Tob, T-O-B, means good or goodness. And it's in the land of Manasseh. And Manasseh means he that is forgotten. Now remember Manasseh, one of the two sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. And when Jacob went to bless those boys in Egypt, he switched his hands and Manasseh should have gotten the firstborn blessing, but he switched his hands and gave it to Ephraim. What's interesting is Manasseh was Joseph's firstborn and Joseph named him Manasseh, meaning forgetfulness. He named him that because Joseph said, I have forgotten the bondage. I've forgotten the bitterness of my time in Egypt. Now God has blessed me. But what happened is Manasseh got the short end of the stick. Yeah. And so as that tribe settled and as that legacy of for forgetfulness rested on them, they came to be known as he that is forgotten. Wow. And so Jephthah goes to what he thinks is a good place. This, is, this will be good for me. I've been rejected here by my own family. This will be good for me. And he becomes a, he joins a gang and he gets that, he gets that sense of belonging. And he becomes a marauder and he, he becomes a mighty, a mighty warrior in that. But he's dwelling in the land of he that is forgotten. And that is what is hanging over him. And I love that rather than staying in that place, God took those very circumstances and brought him back 
as a mighty warrior, as a deliverer and a defender of his people. So here's a map. The land of Tob is way up there in the corner. You can see how far that is from Gilead where he started over here. But what's more important is that while he was hanging out up there, marauding, the Ammonites were attacking all of Israel and nobody could stand against them. And so they went all the way up to Tob to get this one boy, to get this man and say, will you come back and save us? And look at how God righted, righted that story for him when Jephthah accepted God's best for him. So from marauder to mighty warrior, he had to deal with forgiveness in order to go back. And he had to deal with those family ties being restored and becoming a family defender and deliverer again. The next thing I want you to see in his story is he stopped living up to what others determined about him and started living up to what God designed for him. And you need to hear that in your story today because when we get pushed away, when we get kicked to the curb, in whatever way that happens, our tendency is to do what Jephthah did initially. Our tendency is to go and find a good place for us to be, as far away from that as we can get, and to accept that we are forgotten and that we're not going back and that there's nothing better for us than that, but we rest in this place of receiving the negativity, receiving the brokenness of the words that were spoken over us, of those hurtful things that happened to us. And Jephthah did not do it. He entered God's story midway. And I pray that wherever that has been true for you, that you'll hear this message and that you'll receive it and that you'll walk forward in faith. Because I want you to notice the end of that Hebrews verse that I read about Jephthah. Let's look at it again. Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. Look at those highlighted words. Kingdoms from rejected to ruler. Justice where there had been injustice, gained where there had been only loss. The riches of God's promises for him and for many. That's what Jephthah took hold of, and that's why he's in the Hall of Faith. So I wonder today for you, What are, the, what are the kingdoms that will be conquered through you? What, what's the justice that will be administered through your story? What's the gain that is going to come from the loss that you have experienced? You know, I love that there's actually an alternate name meaning of Jephthah. And it actually means whom God sets free. And that is the deliverance of his story. The deliverance of all of our stories. But remember what his name means. He will open. And so my question as we consider the life of Jephthah is what will God open for you? And more importantly, once he opens it for you, what will you open for him? That's the message of Jephthah's life that's left for us in God's hall of faith in Hebrews 11. The second story that we want to talk about today illustrates this truth. God redeems your story as you look to him. Well, you might say, but what if my story is broken beyond recognition or repair? And I would guess that some of our paths have started in that place and we have carried the shattered shards of our stained glass stories with us, but it doesn't in any way resemble what we thought that it would. And that's where we're going to talk about the story of Rahab, because she's actually in the Hall of Faith of Hebrews 11. And I love that she's one of the women who makes that chapter. Let's look at it. Hebrews 11:31. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Rahab, a uh, woman of the evening, uh, a woman of disrepute who was despised and disqualified, but reached for a fresh start and a new legacy for her and her family. What a beautiful story. And in that, she becomes a bridge to blessing 
for not only her family, but as you will soon see, for our entire family of faith, which we'll talk about in a minute. But one of the things I want you to see in her life is that she acted on what she had heard of the Lord and his promises, even before experiencing his presence and power. Look at what Joshua 2, 9 through 12 says. Rahab said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a what? Sure sign. And that sure sign became a scarlet thread that she tied around her window so that when Israel marched against Jericho, they would see that one scarlet thread and recognize that household is going to be saved. Mm -hmm. That woman by faith heard about the Lord before she ever experienced him in his presence or his power. And that household is going to be saved. I want you to see this because we often do it the other way around. Mm -hmm. Even when we know the Lord, we want to experience him. We want him to show up in power. We want to feel his presence before we will trust and go forward in faith. She only had to hear it. And, and not even firsthand. This is, the, this is the talk that was going all around her. What an incredible story of faith that this woman demonstrated. The next thing I want you to see in her story is she entrusted the future of her family completely to the single scarlet thread of God's saving grace. And that became her salvation. Her salvation came through that scarlet sign, which represents the cross. Remember what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin on our behalf that you and I might become the righteousness of God through him. This woman was redeemed. She became a part of Israel. And you're going to see that not only did she become a part of Israel, but she had an even greater role than that, which we'll talk about in a minute. So as you think about your own story and, and the redeeming grace that God has extended to you and how you desire to have that not only for you, but for your household, um, I want to point out a couple things to you because you may say, well, I want that too, but you know what? I've got kids who aren't walking with the Lord. I have grandkids who haven't come to faith yet. I have, an, I have an unbelieving husband. I so desperately want salvation for my loved ones. My parents don't know the Lord. You know, I have brothers and sisters or cousins or whoever. What can you do? First of all, pray. Secondly, proclaim your faith. Somebody said that today. Adele, you said that in whatever ways we can, when we have opportunity, proclaim our faith. Just, just put in a word somewhere of, of what God means for you. Claim his promises for your family. This is what Rahab did. Use pictures and symbols to stand by faith. I'm a big believer in that. There's, there's not that there's anything magic in those things. They just are a physical sign. She put a physical sign on the door that was a sign of salvation. David and I have done this in our home for our girls. I remember there was a time we did Passover with our girls every year as part of our Easter celebration. But there was a year that came when our girls were getting big and they were, they were getting more outside influences in their lives than inside influences from mom and dad. And we were praying for that spiritual legacy on their lives. I remember one Passover, David and I took the cup with the grape juice in it. And we went to every every door of our home and we and we put the blood on the on the doorposts on the lintels of, of every door of our home father we're claiming this room for you don't let the enemy come into this room to that study to this tv room to that bedroom 
uh, you, the blood of Christ is over this house. This house belongs to the Lamb of God. I have friends who anoint things with anointing oil. They anoint people for prayer. They anoint places that they go, that the Lord um, allows them to go into an atmosphere. And just with a drop of oil that maybe nobody else knows about or even sees, says, this is claimed for the Lord. This is a, this is a place where God uh, is invited to come and dwell. We have a stack of Bibles at home in my office that I, um, that I used as a symbol, a picture of this years and years ago. So I have my great-grandfather's theology book that's over 100 years old. We have our grandparents' Bibles. We have our parents' Bibles. We have Dave and my Bible. And I'll never forget the day that my Michelle, my oldest daughter, walked into my study with her brand new New Living Translation Bible and walked right past me to that stack of Bibles that sat as a evidence of the generations that were that were given to the Word of God and to, to live according to that. And she took that Bible, that thin line Bible in her hand, and she smacked it on top of that stack and she said, count me in. And that's five generations. So, so use pictures and symbols and whatever, like Rahab did to say, you know what, Lord, this, uh, th I see this by faith. This may not be true in my life yet, but by faith I see this, and I'm putting this out there as a sign between me and you, as a sign of your promises, as a sign to the enemy of our souls that the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross will be lifted up here, that the power and presence of God will be known here. I love that in the story of Rahab. And you know what? There were whole households who were saved together in the early church such as the households of Cornelius, the Philippian jailer, and Lydia, who we talked about earlier today. But I also want you to see that Jesus warned us that faith would divide some households in Matthew 10, 34 through 36. And that's why you have to pray with such purpose. But please also know that you have to cast your care on the Lord because he is the one who redeems. And I have seen God work through the prayers of women decades past what they prayed. My grandmother married a man who said he was a Christian but had no evidence of that in his life, who became an alcoholic, who beat her, who threatened her life, threatened to kill her and my mom in the womb with a knife because she was pregnant with another girl. And she prayed for that man who divorced her for all the decades that they were apart. And it was when he was dying of cancer on his deathbed that he gave his heart to Jesus. Mm. And I want you to know that your prayers will far outlast you for those that you love and that you're waiting to come to faith in the Lord. And I will promise you that God can meet them and get to them regardless of any, what anybody else can do. If they're in a coma, I've seen it happen. If, if they're in a coma, if they are uh, can't, can't hear or see or whatever, the Lord will get to them and make the gospel clear to them and they will have an opportunity to respond. But one of the things that changed the way that I prayed a few years ago when I taught this, it was a book that I read by Dutch Sheets called What to Pray for Lost Loved Ones. And he gives five prayers to pray. And so I printed them here for you because I think so many times we just pray for their salvation. It's like a blanket prayer. Lord, I want my family saved. Please help so-and-so come to, to know the Lord. Get specific. So this, this blew my mind, and this is so good. Pray these five things. First of all, for the person's heart to be prepared as good soil for seed, Mark 4, 8. Second, that Satan will not be able to steal the seeds of truth, Mark 4, 15 through 19. Three, for God to remove the veil and reveal his word, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, and Ephesians 1, 17. Literally says there's a veil over the eyes of those who don't know the Lord, and that veil has to be removed. Have you ever thought to pray that the veil would be removed? Mm -hmm. Number four, a big one, that the root of pride will be broken. Mm -hmm. Second Corinthians 10, three through five, so that they will soften their heart and submit mm -hmm. to the gospel. Number five, that they will come to true repentance. Second Timothy 2, 25 and 26. And I promise as you pray these prayers, you can take these to the spiritual bank of heaven. Because God will answer these prayers in accordance with your faith and desire. At the end of the day, everybody has to choose. 
for themselves. But can you see the effect of praying such specific prayers as opposed to just praying that your loved ones will come to know the Lord? So I invite you into that place as a, as a Rahab, as a woman who longs not only for her to have a fresh start and a new story, but for her whole household to be saved. The next thing I want you to see is that her faith was woven into the family line of Jesus as the mother of Boaz, a forefather of King David. In fact, Rahab's name appears in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1, 5. That means that not only was she redeemed, but she became royalty. She was the queen mother of, of David. And David was the seed that brought forth Christ. She became not just royalty, she became messianic. Do you see that? That's everlasting reign, and that is unprecedented in the world. No other woman could ever say that. Mm -hmm. And I heralded Queen Elizabeth this morning and her life and legacy, but she couldn't even say that. Rahab became the queen mother of Christ, ultimately, down the line, and Christ will rule and reign forever and ever mm -hmm. kingdom without end Rahab because of one scarlet thread because of one moment of time it wasn't that it wasn't just that that it changed her family you and I are sitting here today because of her what would it be in your life what would be that moment what would be that one act of faith what would be the symbol and sign before the Lord of what you are asking for I love that in the story of Rahab. And in the end, there was no past, there was no shame, there was no judgment. She just became fully accepted and then fully commended in Hebrews 11. Royalty of an everlasting reign. And I want to remind you today that, that if Rahab can go from prostitute to queen mother and be in the birth line of Jesus, there is nothing in your life that cannot be redeemed and turned on a dime to be used for eternal treasure in ways that you could never possibly imagine. So your faithfulness in your life story right now is part of God's grand design of the gospel being known throughout the earth. Don't ever take that for granted and figure out what your scarlet thread is going to be and what it is you're going to ask for and then go and ask big for the kingdom of God by God's grace for his glory. The third story we want to see this morning, and this will be the last one that we'll look at, explains to us the principle that God rewrites your story to be larger than life. He, he actually will rewrite it to be larger than life. Just like that capstone stained glass window where Christ is in the middle and then those who are drawn to him are in the next line and then those who come to faith are in the next circle in that kind of encompassing way, in that encircling way, God will allow your story to impact lives and generations and history if you will let him. When I think about that today, I think of the story of Jacob also. In Hebrews 11. Look at what Hebrews 11.21 says. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Well, that's an interesting verse. Of all the things you could commemorate Jacob for, it, it might not have been those two things. Blessing Joseph's sons. I mean, first of all, these aren't his boys. These are his grand boys. Mm -hmm. And so his vision to look past what was even going to be a forward look in blessing his own children became, no, I'm going to go, I'm going to go beyond that. I'm going to go generations further than that and bring blessing on those that I can bless. And then we'll talk about this interesting phrase leaning on the top of his staff as he worshiped the Lord. Joseph, I mean, Jacob, the guy who was a scoundrel and who stole the blessing from his brother Esau but finally became a nation to bless the whole world through the 12 tribes of Israel, his 12 sons. What an incredible story. So let's think about Jacob as we wrap up today. First, I want you to see that he looked far in the future and claimed God's promises. 
Jacob fled from his home, had to give up his, his happy place there with his parents and with his brother because of what he had done. And on the run, God met him and he had a dream. He laid his head on a stone, remember, and he had a dream and the heavens were open to him and he saw a stairway with angels and it was like God had put him under a portal of the open heavens and said to him, uh, I'm allowing you to see something larger than your life. You are going to be blessed to be a blessing. And, and I'm going to make a covenant between you and me that you will bring heaven to earth through your life. And you understand that every time you pray the Lord's Prayer, you're praying that. You know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, as a king and a priest, you bring heaven to earth in his kingdom in everything that you do. And Jacob had that opportunity. He looked up and then he looked around and everywhere he went, he prospered. He got something more than he started with. Uh, Laban did to Jacob what Jacob did to Esau. Uh, and so when Jacob was going to take Rachel, uh, his, his love, mm -hmm. and work seven years for her, mm -hmm. uh, Laban did a switcheroo, and, sh and he got Leah out of the deal and then had to work another seven years for Rachel. Just wanted one wife, ended up with two. Mm -hmm. Leah ended up producing ten of those twelve tribes of Israel, ten of those sons. But Jacob prospered. He, he made a way. He came out better everywhere that he went. And he claimed that open heaven that was over him to be a blessing. He walked in that kind of favor. And even in blessing his grandsons, he was pushing forward in his faith. Always pushing forward. And he put up an altar in that place to commemorate it. And he, he named it Bethel, or Bethel, we call it. I have seen God. I have I've seen the heavens open to me here, and I am committed to bring that to the earth. One of the things I love about Jacob is he set up altars everywhere he went. This, this man was an altar guy, and there are stones of remembrance all over where Jacob went. And I wonder what those spiritual markers are in your life. Do you set up altars at key points in your life where you can say, God met me here. This is a moment I don't want to forget. I want to tell my children about what God did here. I want to leave a, I want to leave a record for my grandchildren for my neighbors, for my family, for the community. These are spiritual moments and markers in my life. They're places of consecration and commitment to the blessing that each of us have been given in whatever way God would give it to us. The next thing I see in Jacob's life is he embraced the blessing of God in unexpected ways. In unexpected ways. The first, of course, was even getting the blessing in the first place Rebecca had a really big part of that mama bear and Jacob was a mama's boy and you know I don't think he ever saw that coming I don't think he would have initiated that himself but that was an unexpected blessing in his life and he didn't squander it he used it in order to bless a nation and ultimately the whole world so the blessing was unexpected. Getting two wives was unexpected. When Laban said, you can leave with them, but you're not taking anything with you. And Jacob said, well, would you mind? I mean, you can't really use the sheep that are blemished. Could I just take the, the striped and speckled sheep? And he came up with a way to put something in the water that they were drinking. And all of a sudden, there were speckled and striped sheep everywhere. And Jacob left with more than he came with. Uh, he received the blessing of God in unexpected ways. How does God, how does God bless you in unexpected ways? Where, where do you find these things in your life? And how do, you, how do you press into those and use those in a way that will bless others? He, he got the favor of Egypt when his son, who he thought was dead, was really alive. And not just alive, but second in charge of the entire nation of Egypt. And mm -hmm. called J Jacob in his old age to come. And be with them. And, and Jacob brought 70 people with him into Egypt. You know how many left Egypt from Jacob's seed? Two and a half million with Moses. I mean, everywhere Jacob went, he was multiplying. Mm -hmm. Multiplying the blessing that God had given them. Seeing his son again for the first time in decades. Being reunited in his old age. Standing before Pharaoh and Pharaoh bowing to him as a patriarch. It's crazy how this man multiplied what God had bestowed upon him. 
blessing his grandsons and then seeing down the line in his own faith, not that he could see it, but far away that a nation would be birthed and that two and a half million people in 12 tribes, 12 sons of Jacob coming out of Egypt, going through the wilderness, having the very presence of God with them and taking possession of the promised land. And then the last thing I want you to see in his story is he worshiped the true strong and mighty one while leaning on his staff. While leaning on his staff, well, that's an interesting term to write in the great hall of faith in Hebrews 11. When he was dying, why leaning on his staff? Well, first of all, it's a sign of authority. A patriarchal staff is for the patriarch to make oaths and covenants that will be binding, to make declarations of what will happen, blessings for future generations. When Jacob leaned on his staff, he was leaning on that patriarchal authority and saying, this is my true identity, and this is my true identity. I'm passing on to my sons and grandsons. They are not Egyptian. They are Israelite. They are the, the nation of Israel, and I am passing along that legacy. I love that, the sign of authority. But there's another sign, I think, in this case of him leaning on his staff, and that's a sign of his ailment. Do you remember when Jacob wrestled with the angel of God? And I think that was probably Christ in a Christophany before he was incarnated. But he wrestled all night with him. And even in that, Jacob is wrestling with God and he won't let go. And he says, I won't let go of you until you what? Bless me. Until you give me a blessing. Do you not see how this man just pressed with tenacity into the favor of God over and over and over again? And I wonder if you and I do that enough. How often do you ask God to pour his favor on you? Just boundless favor on you. So that you can be blessed to be a blessing. And that's what I see in the life of, of Jacob. But when he leaned on his staff, it was a reminder that when he finally let go of the Lord, the Lord said, okay, I'm going to bless you, but I'm also going to touch your hip. And you're never going to be able to walk right again. You're going to have a limp. And Jacob, leaning on that staff, with that wounded hip, with that weakness in his life, intimately worships the Lord. I want you to hear that today because you have authority in Christ. You are worthy of the calling that he has on your life, and you are to walk worthy of that calling. And he wants you to walk forth with authority and claim some things for him and ask for favor and then receive it and use it to bless many. But you also have weakness. There's also something in your life that, that causes you to walk with a limp. And never despise that weakness because that weakness brings his power to rest on you. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. And his grace is sufficient. Well, there's a lot there, isn't there? Yes. in the stories of Jephthah and Rahab and Jacob. So some final thoughts as we wrap up today, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. First of all, through your life, the Lord is continuing to forge a faith story for the ages. Look at again what Hebrews eleven thirty nine 39 through 40 says. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for who? Us. us. So that only together with us would they be made perfect. Well, what does that mean? That means they never received the promise of Jesus. They walked by faith their whole life, looking forward with a you know, scarlet sign to what Christ would do, but they never, they never saw that. They never could receive that the way you and I have. We know things that they don't know. We have a word that they didn't have. Do you understand what you have today? You have it all. And his story lives on through you. You are part of this circling outward of faith. And you have a stained glass story to tell. And then I want you to see that following God's great hall of faith in Hebrews 11 comes two of the greatest verses about thanksgiving reminding us to be thankful in our own story of faith. 
The first is in Hebrews 12, 28, and it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. You may have had a lot of shaking in your life, and that shaking may have resulted in some broken shards of your stained glass window. But I'll tell you what you have that cannot be shaken. The kingdom of Christ within you and through you. And God wants to use that in your life. And then the second verse about being thankful in Hebrews 13, 15, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And that, that is my heart for you today, that you would hear these stained glass stories from the scriptures and that you would realize that you are now the bearer of that stained glass story in your own life. And the Lord wants you to be thankful for it, regardless of where it took you, even if it went all, even if you went all the way to Tob to get there and God brought you back to his best. Even if you, even if you had such a broken past when God met you that you were a Rahab in a window, but you put out a scarlet thread. Even if you did some things you're not proud of, and you might have been a scoundrel at one time in the beginning, but you asked the Lord to bless you, and you received that open heaven, and you continue to use whatever God has given you in order to bring blessing to so many. Did you know that they found 30,000 shards of broken stained glass hidden away in the vaults of Westminster just recently and they spread all of those broken pieces out and they discovered that they dated back to the 12th century AD to the 15th century AD and you know what they did with them they've been integrating them into the new stained glass stories of faith and faithfulness that are still being put up as windows there in Westminster. And so one of the last things I want to say to you today is integrate your glass. Broken is beautiful. God can use it in ways that you haven't even begun to dream about in order to bring forth the destiny that he has for you. So do you want to know what the newest stained glass window is mm -hmm. at Westminster Abbey? It's the Queen's window to commemorate Queen Elizabeth II. And it was commissioned four years ago. And now it shines as a representative of her life and her legacy. Her legacy will live on as will yours, every day now as well as forever. But as we close today, I just wanna talk about her coronation for a minute because we're gonna see in our lifetime a coronation, none of us knew whether you know we would get to see or not it's kind of an incredible yeah. thing but <clears throat> there are elements of the english coronation that are important for our spiritual lives so i, I want to share it with you as i close today first going back to the throne do you notice anything peculiar about it because right under the seat of the sovereign is a stone that's tucked in underneath and this stone actually comes from scotland and they'll bring it back and they'll slide it back in for King Charles when he is coronated. It's called the Stone of Scone or the Stone of Destiny. And what it means to them is bringing God's rule in heaven to earth. But what's interesting is the background of the stone. Because according to British legend, it goes back not just centuries, but thousands of years. In fact, it was the stone that Jacob put his head on at Bethel and then raised as an altar before the Lord. And they believe that that stone of scone is the actual stone of Jacob. And that altar now is in English hands, used for coronation as a reminder that there is an open heaven over that king or queen. And that it's their responsibility before the Lord to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth in whatever way they can administrate justice and bring deliverance. The king or queen has a sacred position as well. <clears throat> They're considered not just ruler, but also representative of the church. In a very real way, they are kings and priests. 
In fact, when Queen Elizabeth was crowned queen, she was anointed with holy oil, with sacred oil. And the anointing ceremony uh, is completely depicting Leviticus, just like Aaron and his sons were anointed as priests. Queen Elizabeth was anointed. First her hands, and then her head, and then her heart, as the bishop put holy oil on those places, just like Aaron and his sons. She was anointed, not just as a ruler, but as a representative of the church. And what an incredible picture that is for us of the kings and priests, because we are called that in the scriptures as well. And during that coronation ceremony, she received several things to wear and to hold. And one of these things is a jeweled sword that will be belted to her side. A sword. That reminds us of Jephthah what God called Jephthah to do, to defend and to deliver. And then during that ceremony, they're going to put two scepters in her hands, one in her right hand and the other in her left. The first scepter is the scepter that's topped by a cross, and it represents the rule of the Lord Jesus and the work that he did on the cross, that redeeming work and his rule. That's Rahab and what God did in and through Rahab's life, giving a new life and a legacy of faith through her. The second scepter that the queen or king will hold is this one, and it's topped by a dove that represents the Holy Spirit. And that is the story of Jacob that, that illustrates for us the Holy Spirit's work in and through our own life as he forges us and forms us and uses us to further the kingdom, bringing heaven to earth, God's kingdom here and now. That's their legacy as kings and priests. Rahab, as she did it, using the things that God had given her. Jacob, as he did it, using the things that God had put into his hands. Kings and priests unto our God. And today, your life is to represent that king and priesthood of the Lord Jesus. So how are you living that out? I just want to remind you today, remember who you are and remember whose you are. Your life is a continuing testimony in God's hall of faith, a stained glass story that shines forth his promises and faithfulness. So ask for his favor, be a blessing, and go change your world. Be thankful in all the twists and turns of your life and shine forth his glory through your story. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these stained glass stories from your word of people who were broken and bruised and needed binding up, and yet you did all of that and more. There's nothing that stood in your way in order to use regular people in an astounding way. And you want to do the same thing today. We may not be noble in and of ourselves, but we can be notable by walking our own walk of faith. And so, Father, I pray that these truths would sink deep into our own stories and whatever, whatever brokenness there might still be, whatever bitterness there might be from those times of us being cast to the side or hidden away in the corner, Father, I pray that you would call us forth and we would walk worthy of our calling in the full authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even if we walk with a limp, Father, I pray that your strength would be made perfect in our weakness, that your grace would be sufficient, and that our own stained glass stories would shine forth your glory until Jesus comes. In your name.